everyone. Hi, this is Lloyd. And of course, I'm here with uh, Austruth Apologetics AT. And, What's up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, man, you, you couldn't ask for a better looking apologist and you are the best amongst them. Thank uh, you, sir. I've been I've been lifting weights. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it works out well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is the Apologetics and Comedy channel. <clears throat> um yeah guys hey thank you all very much for joining us this evening and uh, at again thank you very much for uh for guesting with me helping me out here and uh, happy to be here well, brother no thank you i couldn't do this without you and um yeah and for many others out there from yourself and many others i, I learn a lot about christian doctrine um obviously as everyone knows i'm so much more familiar with with islam so yeah guys today we're here to talk about ahmed didat <clears throat> the biblical dis expert <laughs> and yeah, we're going to be discussing again many of his, um, I think, blatant falsehoods. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let me let's go and see what's happening in the chat. Nothing at the moment. Hey guys, I also want to make sure that we are seeing good. Yes, we have an excellent connection, and everything's looking solid on the stream. Okay, so let me close. Let me minimize that. Bring up this. And I was checking to make sure our sound's coming through, and it is, so that's good, too. Yeah, yeah, I tested this well before, and I'm starting to get good with that. I'm making less technical boo-boos, a few here and there, but but finally getting to grips with it. Um, learned how to set up my mic properly. That, that helps. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it does. Okay, guys, so the, the last time we did the show, um, we were discussing many of the things that Ahmad Didat is known to have said about Christianity and Ahmad Didat hated Christianity. He was teaching classes around the world. I've actually watched some video of him teaching these classes and he was doing terrible misrepresentation of Christian doctrine. So I wonder, let me get to actually sharing my screen. So yeah, I think this should be showing. Let me close that. Oops. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, let me just move us over to the right hand side. I'm going to okay there we go that's a little better so guys just to remind you a little bit about so we're discussing a book by Ahmad Didat called um, the combat kit against bible thumpets right so for instance these are not this is not an index what you're seeing here is not an index which then leads you to a page number which tells you more about it this is literally the entire entry right so to eat poop and drink Peep as he gives here, that is literally the entire entry. There is no context. He provides no detail. What you see here is the evidence. There's no mention of the fact that these are threats made by someone who was at that time at war with the Jews, was trying to kill them and was starving them in their city while they were under siege. And he told them that if they do not surrender and submit to his forces, they will then they have nothing left to eat. And he was basically swearing at them. And mm. Didat simply leaves this here and leaves people to draw very, very false impressions. Yep. So if someone threatens you, apparently that's Christian doctrine. Uh, your thoughts on that, A.T.? Well, I think the, the I read a thing actually, and you, I can't remember whose video it was, but the best liars are the ones who believe they're telling the truth. Um, and, and I think that's why... Uh, Ahmed Didat, I think he knows that he was lying, but the reason why he makes it so vague is so that when a lay person goes and researches this, they're going to jump to conclusions, be fully convinced in their own mind of the truthfulness of, of what their conclusions are, so that when they present it to other people, right, the best liars are the ones who, who believe they're telling the truth. Um, right. So I, I understand why he's, he's doing what he's doing. Yeah, so I understand. So this is not a commandment from God to the Jews or to anyone. This is, remember, the Bible is history. It is descriptive. It is history. Whereas the Quran and the Sunnah are not the same. They are prescriptive. Right. They are law. Right. They're right. an example to follow. These are merely, merely stories. And many of these stories describe things that were sinful, things that were wrong. They're simply mm -hmm. a history of man's development through the ages of mistakes that were made of good things that happened. So it's a mishmash of many, many different things. It's a narrative. Point. Right. And because so this is not a command from God. This is a threat from an enemy. So unfortunately, this is how and this is what Muslims believe. I don't know where, where God says 
you need to eat poop and drink your urine. Although I do know, I do know of the leader, in fact, the founder of this of a cult. <laughs> Sorry, no, of oh, this religion. My my bad. Excuse my excuse my my poor command of the language there. Who did command <laughs> his followers to drink urine? Uh, do you mm -hmm. know any such person? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think, uh, there's a, it, it was he an Arabian guy? I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank, but I, I think he was an Arabian guy who claimed that he was a prophet. Um, and I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of urine drinking going on. Um, as I Camels. recall, his wife made it very clear that he only pretended he received to be a prophet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me actually... Yeah, somehow, somehow, uh, Allah was very convenient to him. Uh, um, when it came to yes. his revelations. As his Seems wife like... said, Aisha once angrily said to the Messenger of Allah, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. Mm. That's his wife speaking. Of course, she's the mother of all Muslims, right? The mother of the... <laughs> the... <laughs> mother of believers. Um, and yes. I think probably the like the mother of common sense, at least, who... <laughs> <laughs> um, like, honestly, when, when I read through the sources, she's like my favorite person. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. a, even he says the superiority of Aisha over other women is like the superiority of this food over other food <laughs> compared to food or some stuff. Right. Well, because because women are food, right? You're just supposed to pluck them off the tree and do whatever you want with them, I suppose. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, so understand this is Ahmadita. Now, what I want to do is so what you see, here, this is page five. Right. This book is a short 32 pages. It is linked in the description. Please download it. Check for yourself. Hi, Stephen. Uh, sorry to have missed you. Um, yeah, Ahmadita hated Christianity. That is very true. And uh, yeah, <laughs> seeking the truth says maybe she doesn't say what she's talking about since she was only nine. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, she said she was nine um, uh, when the prophet uh, consummated marriage with her. But if you ask some other Muslim apologist, she was 16 or 19 or 29 or who knows? Who she knows? was 18, which is six and six and six. Yep. Yep. Three sixes. That makes sense. That, that, uh, mark they, of the beast right there. So, solve that one. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, there's the, and then of course there's six, six, eight, which as you know, is the neighbor of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the comedy channel, everyone. Jokes, yeah. jokes are free. Yeah, but also DHC says, yeah, a nine-year-old does not have a filter in their head. So, yeah, we're not here to talk about the number of the beast or the neighbor of the beast. We'll leave that for people who discuss other topics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so Muslims very commonly tell me that I cherry pick. So, in, in other words, if I was asked what is one plus one and I said two, I would be accused of cherry picking. Cherry picking yeah. in Islam means to know the right answer, right? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. so, if they, so, if they say what's three plus three and I say six, They'd say that's cherry picking. Mm. I love to cherry pick, and I copied and pasted. They'd call me a copy pasting cherry picker for knowing that three plus three is equal to six. Lloyd, so, what are yeah. you copying and pasting? Where where are you getting these copy and paste things from? Out of Islamic texts, out of the what? authoritative Islamic text. No, you couldn't possibly be doing that. Why yeah. would that be wrong of you to to copy and paste their texts and and show them in full context? Um, Correct, that, and know. provide the download links. Because understand, people, the Sharia is the context. The Sharia is the interpretation and is the context of everything in the Quran and the Sunnah. So, guys, yeah, what I want to do is I want to kick off <clears throat> this episode. Uh, Veronica says you picked the right answer. That's practically unheard of in Islam. I, I think that's a fairly good point. Hi, Steffi Calligraphy. Welcome. Okay, yeah, looks like looks like everyone has joined us. Let me actually let me not bring up my my screen because yeah, yeah, it's fine enough. Okay, yeah, looks like uh, we've got a good crowd now, so we can we can kick this off. Um, yeah, so guys, in Revelations one eighteen, Jesus says, I am the living one, I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. And in other translations, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Now, I want to play just a 60-second clip of Ahmed Dida debating Josh McDowell, and I believe this was 1981 in Durban, South Africa. The link is, actually, let me move us up. Here we go. So, yeah, you can see the link on the bottom right if you want to find this video. So, let me play this for us. It's called Ahmed Dida Losing Debate with Josh McDowell. 
throughout the length and breadth of the 27 books of the New Testament, there is not a single statement made by Jesus Christ that I was dead and I have come back from the dead. We have been beating Jesus Christ never uttered that word that I have come back from the dead in the 27 books of the New Testament, not once. He was there with them for 40 days and he never uttered that statement. I, I'm not sure that I heard myself. You said nowhere in the 27 books of the New Testament did Jesus ever say he was dead and alive? May I read to you from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18? He said, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. As you'll notice after that, Ahmadita sat there very silently. And in that debate with Josh McDowell, which I watched, it's about two hours long, Ahmed Didat came back from this and other replies rattled. Mm. Visibly, his voice was <coughs> rattled. So, yeah, your thoughts, AT, and then I can let you kick it off. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Um, um, so, just, so in just in terms, terms of my, of my thoughts, thoughts, I could, I not, could hear not hear it on my, my end. end. So, so um, um, you know, you know, so, so that's, that's, that's about, about as far as my thoughts. thoughts. Oh, I thought about, 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 about turning, turning up the volume, up the volume but, I but I didn't want there to be. Oh, no, so, so, so Didat basically states that nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus claim that he was died and resurrected, that he's, you know, dead and is now living. And very calmly, very calmly, Josh McDowell reads this out and says, I, I wasn't sure I heard you correctly, Ahmed, but let me read you this. Right, right, so he, so he, he read, read Revelation, Revelation 118, 118 um, which I think, I think is perfect, perfect. Obviously, obviously those, those are Christ's, Christ's own words, words. Um, um, but even, but even if, if you look back, back into, into Jesus', Jesus life, life and teachings, teachings uh, one, of one of the main, main themes, themes that he, he continued, continued to, to remind, remind everyone of, his followers of, is the fact that he was going to be executed and that uh, he was going to be resurrected. So you can work at it from two different ways, right? You can work at it from after the event in terms of revelation, or you could work at it in Christ's own words as, as spoken before, before the events. Um, and the other thing I want Muslims to consider with that stuff too, is the fact that, uh, he, um, that the, the Quran itself affirms the inspiration, preservation and authority of the Bible. So the Bible clearly depicts Christ as being um, crucified and resurrected. So the fact that Ahmed would even try to make that argument, um, I just think it shows a level of insanity of his own his own belief system. Yeah, which is very unfortunate. So yeah, so guys, I'm going to open up the floor to AT if you want to. Share. Are you going to share your screen? Yeah, let me go ahead and start uh, start doing that. Here in just a second. So you should see that. I'll start the PowerPoint. Okay, we've got to turn off mine. You can maximize your screen now. Yep, it should be up and running, maxed out. Um, so it is a so the 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 combat kit, we went through this a couple of weeks ago. We went through kind of his first thing, which was um when he was trying to say about Arabs in Arabia. Um there are a whole bunch of different points. He has like 30 some odd points in here. So this might take us a few weeks to kind of get through everything. Some of his mm -hmm. points and topics are pretty short so we can com like combine them. Some of them are fairly lengthy and require a little bit more of a response to it. Um, but today, basically, we're just going to be talking about Abraham and what the Bible says and what I believe Ahmed is trying to portray and why he's having... Um, Muslims, you know, mark this in their Bible and then show it to Christians. Um, so it's kind of a, around the lines of absurdities. So his his first claim when it comes to Abraham is that Abraham married his sister. So when I first read this, right, and if you guys have read through the Bible, you see this, and a lot of times we might skip past it and we might think automatically, oh, no, he didn't. Um, but you'll see here that it, he actually did. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this and we'll talk about what it means 
to Christianity or to Judaism uh, or even to Islam, right? Because that's this is the book that started all the books, right? This is what Islam stands on is is the Torah and the Gospels and uh, and whatnot. So what he says in it is, why sayest thou, O Abraham, she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me, um, my wife. Now take her, Sarah, and go on thy way. That's Genesis 12, 19. And in another place in Genesis 20, 12, it says, and yet indeed she is my sister and she became my wife. Uh, a lot of stuff Ahmed does is he takes it out of context, right? And in this particular circumstance, he does, but the thing that he's portraying is actually accurate. Uh, but I, I do want to read this out to you guys here in Genesis 12, 17 to 20. So to put it in a fuller context, uh, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of uh, Sarai. So I'm going to say Sarai and Abram because their name got changed after they had uh, children to Sarah and Abraham. Uh, so Pharaoh called Abraham and said, uh, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Uh, in 2011 through 12, uh, Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God in all of this place and that they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, probably all of us feel uncomfortable with this, right? This is kind of an incestuous type of relationship. Um, but here's, here's what I want us to all consider. Um, this is reality. Reality can be uncomfortable. So we have to think about the motives of the biblical authors. So if I'm a Bible author, I'm a Jewish person, and the father of my faith, Abraham, is uh, someone who I want to uplift and put in the greatest light possible, I'm going to have a motivation to not include this in my book, right? Why would someone include that in their book? This is, this is an embarrassing thing for our faith. So why would you include it if it wasn't true? So what this shows us is this shows us that um, that the authors of the Bible were true and they were honest and they had integrity when they wrote the Bible. Now, if you compare that to, to the Quran and how it recalls history, um, they had a motive as well. They would have changed certain stories to make the outcome look better for them, right? That means that they're lying if they're doing that as opposed to being true to it. So yes, Abraham did marry his half-sister. Um, and when textual critics and historians parse through ancient narratives such as the Bible, um, they use what's known as the criteria of embarrassment to, to determine the truthfulness or uh, fictionalness, I don't know if that's a word or not, of certain books, right? Um, and because it includes these embarrassing facts, that gives credence to the honesty and truthfulness of the book. So is it absurd? Yes, it's absurd. Does this fact somehow make the Bible a false book? No, actually it doesn't, and it's quite to the contrary. It strengthens well, its historicity. That, is this example of Abraham considered Sunnah? Is this considered the example for all Jews and all Christians to follow for all time? No, it's just telling a story. Yeah. So, so it shows the, that, does it also show that, that the prophets could sin, the prophets could make mistakes, the prophets could could do things that weren't always ideal? Yeah, absolutely it does. And and that kind of leads us in, into our next point. Yeah. Um, on that, which I just is, wanted to add a point that yeah, in Islam, ahead. they claim that all the prophets were perfect and sinless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they claim that Muhammad was sinless. And of course, we do know that there are multiple attestations to the fact that Muhammad was not sinless and Muhammad actually did many immoral things. But yet they still imply and say, and they say therefore that we insult and slur and slander the prophets by claiming that they were not perfect. Right, wow, right. Thank and, you very and much. What do you say? What do you say about slander? What is this thing you say about slander in Islam? Is to say something that is true about someone mm -hmm. that they would prefer not spoken. Right, right. And the real definition of slander is saying something that is that is untrue. So 
when we read through the Bible, I'm going to highlight a lot of different biblical characters. What we read about is flawed individuals, right? Real people, not fake, made up, perfect people, but real people whom God uses to to uh, accomplish his his perfect purpose, right? So God is a redeemer over and over again. That is who he is. That is part of his nature. That is what he does through his love. And I'll explain why uh, it is so here as, as we continue through, right? So uh, Jesus says in Mark 2, 16 to 17, um, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he, Jesus, was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, right? So I came not to call the righteous, but to the sinners, right? So God calls upon sinners, okay? And another thing I want us to consider here too is which person is perfect and which person ever in history is righteous. Lloyd, can you think of anyone in history that was perfect and righteous? Um, well, now we claim as Christians that Jesus was perfect. Jesus did not sin, but of course, Islam claims that Muhammad was perfect and it's actually blasphemy and the death penalty to claim otherwise. Although, of course, he prays for forgiveness and he is said to have sinned multiple times. Yeah. So everyone in history, including you, including me, including everybody watching this, has sinned. They have, we have fallen short of the glory of God, right? Except for Jesus. Correct. And even in the Quran, he was perfect, sinless. Um, it says in the Quran that Satan touches everyone, right? <laughs> Except for two people, right? Mary and Jesus. Right. That means that they were sinless, according to the Quran, and that, uh, you know, they were perfect and everyone else's stands condemned. So, you know, I just want you guys to think about that. So God does not use perfect people to accomplish his task, because if he did, who would receive the glory? Right. The perfect people or God? Well, if a really strong person does a really strong thing, you go, oh, they did it on their own strength. But if a really weak person does a really strong thing, that points to a greater being who has strengthened them, right? That gives glory to God. Um, so God uses flawed people to give his, his glory. So Moses, he used Moses, right? Moses was uh, used very, very powerfully, and he led the Egypts out of Israel, but he had a stutter, God used him anyway. Why didn't God use like the strongest orator of all time to do it? Why didn't God strengthen Pharaoh and have Pharaoh do all of this? He yeah. used a weak person. Moses murdered someone. Moses uh, was not well received and not well respected by the Hebrews. Uh, Judah is um, was a liar, right? Judah was a betrayer and Judah was a fornicator, right? But through Judah's line comes King David, comes Jesus, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? God uses flawed people um, yeah. to strengthen his purpose. David, King David, right? He committed adultery. He conspired to murder someone um, and kind of using David and, and Goliath, right? So in the story of David and Goliath, David is portrayed as like this small little boy, essentially, armed with, he didn't even put on armor. He couldn't even stand with the armor of the king. He just went out there without any, any protection. He yeah. had a rock and a sling and he slayed a giant. Now, if we were to reverse the story and God were to have used Goliath and Goliath just walks out there, chops off David's head, who would get the glory in that sense? We would go, oh yeah, the biggest, strongest guy in the well, whole world killed like a tiny little I boy. Mean, I would say that, that, that tigers are not praised for killing chickens. Uh, but I do want right. to raise one small point. I want to bring up mm -hmm. something. This, what I'm showing at the moment is a book called, uh, actually, let me just skip to the title of the book. So this book is a very well-known, it's actually a Sharia manual because it contains the rulings on insults against Muhammad. And of course, you notice it says the unsheathed sword or the drawn sword against the one who insults Muhammad, not against Allah, oddly enough, right? <clears throat> but 
so this contains the rulings on what on a crime called Saba Rasul. Saba Rasul is to insult the Prophet, right? And I want you to have a look here. Just wait for that to render again. So I want you to see here though, the scholars, now these are the Sharia rulings, and it says here, the scholars have consensus that whoever insults the messenger, attributing a defect to him, then such a person is a disbeliever, right? And the Muslim mm -hmm. who insults is killed. There's no disagreement concerning that. This is the view of the four Imams and others than, and other than them. Now, the four Imams are, of course, the founders of the four schools of Sharia jurisprudence, right, of Islamic jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, yes, uh, Mikhail de Fliss, Muslims want lots of crazy things. And, of course, yeah. So, yeah, on that point, it should be noted that it is blasphemy and it is a crime punishable by death. For instance, I do not know anyone who differed concerning the obligation of killing such a person. So if you believe that Muhammad is less than perfect, you, under strict Sharia law, should be killed. This is the Sharia. Right? Of course, they claim they're following the laws of Moses. However, Moses was not considered to be perfect. Moses was a sinner too. And mm -hmm. this is not, this is, this is placing Muhammad well beyond the status of an actual prophet. No prophet right. is worshipped the way Muhammad is worshipped. No prophet is followed because the prophets pointed to God. The Quran points to Muhammad. It's, that's that's very true. Uh, I, I do have a, a question, Lloyd. If um, someone were to say something negative about, let's say, Jesus or David or Solomon or any of the other prophets in Islam, is the same ruling applied to them in terms of they're a disbeliever and they should be killed, or is it only Muhammad? Only Muhammad. Only Muhammad. Anyone else? Anyone else may, if you, in theory, if you doubt any of the other prophets, for argument's sake, and everyone else is a prophet, then they may hit you with a stick. They may beat you. That's okay. one possibility. But right, but that this, doesn't make them a disbeliever? No. Okay. I don't, I don't understand that It just that makes logic, them, I believe okay. the term is fasik. It makes them corrupt, but it doesn't gotcha. make them a murtad. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, other people in the Bible who have, um, you know, done terrible things like Solomon, he had like 700 concubines and 300 wives. Uh, God still used him to build the temple to him. The first temple was built. He wrote a bunch of books. He was given a bunch of wisdom um, by God. Samson uh, was disobedient. He visited prostitutes and he was arrogant. And yet God still used him to advance his, his purposes. Uh, Joseph was pretty conceited. Um, he was pretty weak in a lot of senses, right? He was thrown uh, into a pit by his brothers. He was sold into slavery, and yet God used his weakness um, to raise him up to be the top person in Pharaoh's household, which obviously led to the uh, his brothers and led to Israel being rescued when there was a famine. Uh, Jonah was a very grumpy man. Um, he was spiteful. He was disobedient to God. And yet he delivered one of the shortest messages to anyone uh, in Nineveh. And they heard his very short sentence and they all repented and they were all saved by God. So God uses weak people, flawed people, so that when we read about their story, we go, holy cow, God is the one who is doing all of this stuff and not just some general, general man. So God is enough. That's what all of the stories relate to. God is a redeemer. God strengthens weak people. And, and one of my favorite verses in the Bible, because all of us, I think, can relate to this, um, is in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So Paul was wrestling with a weakness and, and he asked God to remove that weakness. And what God said to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So therefore, I, Paul, will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So this, is, this demonstrates that Ahmed Didat does not understand the theology of God. He's, he's failing in that sense. Uh, he moves on to Abraham marrying Hagar. I literally have no idea why he put this in here. So what? Abraham married Hagar. 
So Hagar, Abraham's wife, is what he says. And she, Sarah, gave her Hagar and to her husband to be his wife. Again, he pulls this a little bit out of context, so let's read it in context. So now uh, Sarai, Abram's wife, was born to him. No children, right? So let's talk about using weakness, okay? She had a female Egyptian slave whose name was Hagar, and Sarai said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children through her. So I'm going to pause here really quick and show you that even Abraham, the father of faith, right, the one whose faith has saved him, the faith that gave him the promise, he actually lost faith as well. And he listened to his wife, Sarah, and he took a wife that was not given to him by God. And in, and in essence, he rebelled against what God's wishes were. And if you know the story, you see how God even redeems that Um so that's that's part of the theology that a lot of Muslims just don't understand. Um, so Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. So what does this can I, mean? Can I go? Sorry, yeah? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, on that point, let me bring up something. Um, guys, as you know... Uh, Friday evening, I did a talk and I was discussing um, the Muslims being the chosen people and the implications of that in terms mm -hmm. of Christians, where they literally are taught that Christians are animals, right? That all non-Muslims, in fact, but especially Christians and Jews are mm -hmm. animals. We are beasts. And um, the way that they are taught to hate us. Now, I want to bring up this. Now, I didn't do every single, <laughs> I went on longer than intended, but anyway, let me skip forward. Uh, what I want you to see is this this was part of the talk and I need I didn't get to it because it went longer than I intended um, But so we have Hagar or Hajar and Sarah now These are also symbolic. There's also symbolic meaning here. We have two covenants We have the covenant of works and the law and the covenant of grace Now the first covenant is what Hagar stands for. This is the covenant of works now, mm -hmm. this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She's mm -hmm. Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she's in slavery with her children. This is the covenant of the law, the Hagar covenant. Right. Now, we are talking about BibleGateway.com is the site that I'm using for this particular reference, although mm -hmm. any will do. I'm talking about Galatians 3, verse 20. Right. Uh, Galatians 4. Um, I think it's 3 verse 20. Uh, good grief. Actually, hold on. Did I get this wrong? Let me have a look. My bad. Just give me a second because I forgot to write out the reference. Ah, Galatians 4, 20 to 31. My bad. So this is Galatians 4, 20 to 31. And now you, so this is the covenant of the law, the Hagar covenant. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just at mm -hmm. that time when he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, yep. brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is Paul in Galatians, right? He was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. So understand, though, Christianity is suffering a genocide at this point in history. And, of course, we are being persecuted by those born of the flesh. So Hagar is born of the flesh, whereas Sarah is the spirit, the promise. Mm -hmm. right? yep. So these are two different covenants. Now, let's have a quick look at Genesis, which foretells this as well as Isaiah. Abram had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. He was of the bondwoman, was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Yep. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free so I want to raise, so I just want, knowing a man is not justified, and this is Galatians 2.16, a critical passage yep. in the Bible. Good, good. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. And this is Paul speaking again, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And this is what Islam wants to return to. Technically, they claim the law of Moses. So that's the allegorical implication. Uh, let me continue a little bit here. So uh, the, Sarah of Co the Sarah covenant is the covenant of grace, not made mm -hmm. with God and man, 
but made with God and Christ Jesus. All the prior yes. covenants were made with God directly with a particular person for a given time and place and situation. But the covenant of works was, do this and live, man. But the covenant of grace is, do this, Christ, and you shall live, O man. So Christ literally did sacrifice himself for us. This is a complete alteration mm -hmm. of the order of the way things had been until then. Right. So instead of a covenant directly with a man who had to fulfill a certain contract or set of conditions, and God would look after them, in this case, Jesus would fulfill the law of God. Right. And then man would be the beneficiary of that. So the difference of the covenants rests here. So allegorically, Hagar was not intended as a wife. She was a handmaid to Sarah. The interpretation from Christian scholars is that the law is a handmaid to the covenant of grace. So one mm -hmm. could argue that God never conceived that man would attain perfection by it, right? Hence, there would be a Messiah and a new covenant, and God Correct. keeps his promises. Now, there are mm -hmm. those who hate the Jews, and they want to imply otherwise. However, God does not lie, right? So That's perfect. So I don't know if I should finish with this from Ezekiel, but let me, let me leave it there for the moment, and we'll, I'll talk about that another time. I'll, let's go back. So okay. hopefully that gives yeah. additional context. Right. No. And, and thank, thank you for that. That's really, that's really good and, and powerful in, information. Um, so basically my point with this is this is, this is nonsense. Um, and so I don't even know what Ahmed's talking about. Uh, he makes a polemic against Abraham here. He considers, uh, this next thing to be, uh, an unfulfilled prophecy. And this is where we really see again, his cherry picking and taking things out of context. Um, what he says in the book is, I will give unto thee, O Abraham, the land therein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, which he calls Palestine, uh, for the everlasting possession, and I will be their God, right? So that you can see that in Genesis 17, 8, 13, 15, and Exodus 32, 13. So he makes a comment here, poor Abraham did not receive a single square foot of land free. Um, so that's his that's his understanding of it is that even though God promised him the land, Abraham did not receive the land. Let's see if that's actually true. So this is what Genesis 13, 15 says in context. So the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abraham moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And here he built an altar to the Lord. So he's saying that Abraham didn't receive the land. And yet when we read the full verse in context, it says, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give to you. So Abraham moved his tent and came and settled. He settled where? Where did he settle, Lloyd? Where, where, where did he settle? Um, looks like they settled in Israel, in the Holy Land. Right, in the land that, that God, God promised gave him. him. Right, the exactly. The promised land, so well, I, it's cool, but also the, that's why it's, Sarah is of promise. Right. Yeah. Can, I add, can I add to that as well from the notes that add I have? Add away, from, my friend, add away. Thanks. So, guys, yeah, again, um, uh, sorry, let me go. There we go. Yeah, so on this point, again, uh, let me just move my screen to the top right and take away um, this. So, on that point that was just raised, this is Ezekiel 36, 20 to 36, and this lines up with what I was talking about the chosen people. Now, I didn't finish all the notes that I was discussing on Friday, but this was part of it. But there's context that's missing above. But this is relevant to what we've just said. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my ordinances and do them and you will live in the land that I gave to your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. On the day that I cleanse you from all your sins, I will also cause the cities of Israel to be inhabited. The ruins will be rebuilt, the desolated land 
will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. This land that was deserted and desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. So I think that's just further affirmation of what you have just stated. No, and that's that's perfect. I mean, and, and we're not really talking about a uh, new heart, new spirit, all that kind of stuff. But since you since you brought it up, that's also a prophecy uh, that Jesus fulfilled, right? When he said, I you have to be born again, you have to be given a new heart, a new spirit. Um, you know, and we see when the new spirit is brought right on the day of Pentecost um, and the new heart and it it brings, you know, obviously new yeah. new believers. Yeah, guys, I want to, if I can point out something related to the comments, and I was speaking with AT a little bit before this, and um, Stephen, when I have a chance to chat with you, this is something I'd also like to raise with you. The polemics that Muslims are using today are not new. These are polemics that have been around for about 800 years. They, they go back to the, 12, to the 13th and 14th centuries, right? There are a couple of major scholars that I've defined. I've given you some of those books. Recently, in my most recent video, have a look at that Ibn Qayyim's book. Read that. Those polemics have long been established. The precedent was established about 800 years ago. They are mm -hmm. simply repeating the very same polemics. So understand that. And we need to understand that they literally teach young Muslims that Jesus was a Muslim. And that we have it wrong. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I was discussing, I was showing the examples, I was showing the specific examples that they teach within their madrasas, within their mosques. So we need to first understand where they are coming from, because they've never actually told us, they've never actually explained to us, right? Right. So we need to understand how they actually perceive this, how they have taken this thing and twisted it, and provided mm -hmm. their own um, interpretation of it, right? So, yep. so yeah, they, they, they quite literally believe that, that we have, I mean, you should see it. And I think we it will, hopefully we'll do a talk on that in the future and you'll see. Um, yeah, back to you. Sorry, AT. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that talk. Yeah, I think that'll be really, really powerful as well. So, uh, Ahmed, bro, uh, pretty sure that he did receive a foot of land. So once again, he's wrong. Now, what he ends up doing here and I think he put these two things together because he takes again Stephen's uh Stephen's account before his martyrdom and the book of Acts he says that Stephen says he did not so much as set his foot upon the promised land right so he's saying hey look this is an unfulfilled prophecy God promised the land to Abraham and yet Stephen's over here saying that Abraham did not receive the land now we already read in Genesis that he did receive the land. So the question now becomes, is there a contradiction between Stephen's account and Abraham's account, right? So to put this into context, uh, Acts 7, uh, verses 2 to 8 says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go to the into the land I will show you. He went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into the land of which you are living now. So we're going to pause here really quick. Who is Stephen talking to? He's talking to people, Jews, living in Jerusalem, in the promised land. So that means that, guess what? They have the land. Um, yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child and God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in the land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob, the 12 patriarchs. So this is the highlighted verse that or the highlighted part that we're going to want to be looking into. So he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. Is this a contradiction? Is Stephen saying that Abraham never got possession of the land? Is that what he's saying? Well, let's look at this. So at the very time Abraham was receiving that message, he had not yet received the inheritance. But when we read Genesis, clearly it shows that Abraham settled in that land and God's promise is fulfilled in that moment. So swing and a miss there, Mr. Ahmed Didat, again, once again, fail. 
So that's all I have. That was that was as quickly okay, as I no, could get. Excellent. This. Okay, no, thank you for that. So yeah, guys, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, yeah, so I'll continue. I've got a few slides as well. Um, yeah, seeking the truth, that's a correct. They even go as far as saying at the end times, Jesus comes back as a Muslim and will be a Muslim imam and pray the Muslim prayer with everyone. He'll pray behind Muhammad. He will serve Muhammad and he will destroy the church. Now, guys, so what I'm going to bring up now, um, you have seen this before. I'm just going to um, just get my screen ready. Yeah, so let me just do that. Yep, so I'm just going to unshare your screen. So guys, we, we've discussed this briefly in the past. I'm going to go through this then. So yeah, we'll try not to go for too much longer than an hour, right, AT? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Josie Wells says, you would think that they could come up with a new argument. I could read anything in the Quran after it's a crazy book that has no order. That is true. Um, you must understand that not only are the Quran's chapters out of sequence. Remember that mm -hmm. they're roughly sorted by length of chapter, approximately by length of chapter, length longest to shortest. Of course, it starts with the first chapter, the Fatiha, the opening, which is only about seven verses or so. However, not only are the chapters not in chronological sequence, you need to understand that even the verses are not in chronological sequence. This is something that very few people know. The Quran's mm -hmm. verses, okay, the verses in the chapter are also out of sequence. So it's been deliberately scrambled. So yeah, so guys, now now I'm going to talk a little bit again about good old Mr. Ahmad Didat. Let me just uh, get to that point. Now, he simply made the statement, as I showed you earlier, that he speaks of to eat poop and drink pee, and he doesn't explain what it means. He doesn't explain it. He just makes, he basically implies Right, through in a window or whatever, that this is a command from God. Now, of course, they obviously claim it's the same God, but then they also claim that we corrupted the Bible, but they can't give us a pure copy of the Bible. And of course, they've got no <laughs> copies of the Quran. So, right, you tell me, right? So, anyway, on that point, so now, 2 Kings 18, to eat, poop, and drink pee. Now, don't forget, he actually swears, okay, in this, in his book, right? From where do we know? Um, yeah, if you read through some of the sources that I've been reading through, Veronica, they'll tell you that the the that you have to be a proper scholar to understand the right sequence because apparently Muhammad created the sequence like that. It's you've got to read through a bunch of different books to find all these statements. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's just the way the Quran is, and um, yeah. So anyway, then the king of Assyria sent to the sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshake from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. The Rabshake is not a name, it's a title. It describes the field commander for the Assyrian army. He represented the Assyrian kings, Sennacherib. <clears throat> and of course, he wanted to demoralize the Judeans with threats so that they would surrender. And he said, as my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words. He threatened them using fear, discouragement, and despair, telling them that they would have no food or water, and they would end up eating their own poop and drinking their own peep if they did not surrender to him, because he would force them into this abject state of despair. And, of course, let me just move this over to the right. And he said to them, as a threat to the Jews, he said, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? So that Abshake pointed forward to the conditions that would exist in Jerusalem after an extended siege. He wanted to offend and to frighten the Jews. And he wanted to magnify the sense of fear, discouragement, and despair. This was propaganda from an enemy. And Muhammad, sorry, Muhammad uh, Dida simply says this absolutely minus context. He just takes those few words and puts it forward. And that is somehow his amazing scholarship. Right, it's an Islamic term. <laughs> scholar. Yes, yeah, he was a scholar of note. Now, mm -hmm. now, moving on. So understand, this is completely just, just false, right? Now let's have a look. To eat cake with poop. Now this is another statement that he makes. Just to eat cake with, with you know, with, yeah, you f f change the word poop, right? And... Here's the recipe in Ezekiel 4, 9. Now, this is in reference to Ezekiel 4, 12 to 15. Take unto you wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and fitches, which is a kind of corn, and put them in one vessel and make thee bread. Notice there is no poop as an ingredient. 
Okay. Mm. And in Ezekiel 4.12, and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with the dung that comes from man in his sight. Now understand, there is going to be a food shortage, because again, in this situation, they are under siege, they're running out of food, they're running out of water. And they, typically, it was considered unclean for the Jews to utilize animal dung, right? Cow dung is used across Asia as fuel to make food, as fire, firewood, basically, the way we would use firewood. Of course, they ran out of firewood because they ate all the cows, they ate all the, the animals to survive, right? Because they were, had no food, they were trapped inside the city. And eventually, they were going to be forced to have to use human waste, which was considered unclean to the Jews. But this is the situation they were going to be in if they didn't surrender, and they did not want to surrender. Understand? So bake it, use it fuel of human waste. So they didn't notice it doesn't say bake your bread with, right? As in as an ingredient. But this is what mm -hmm. Ahmadidat implies. So this is a very very dishonest man, right? So anyway. Now, they're speaking of the desperation of siege. They're speaking of the misery of exile for the Jews amongst the Gentiles, where the care for kosher food and its preparation were impossible because the, the pagans at the time and the Gentiles did not keep kosher. They were not Jews, right? So dried animal fuel, right? Dried animal dung was used as fuel. However, all the cattle would be killed for food. So only human excrement would be available for fuel. That's the scholar called Wright. And according to Feinberg, normally dung would not be used as a fire to bake bread. It was considered unclean. So in other words, this is to highlight in the context of the day that the Jews were living in unclean conditions. Do you have anything to say regarding that before I move on, A.T.? Um, no. Well, yeah, I guess a little bit. So some of the some of the things um, that Muslims also need to understand, and I think a lot of us Christians need to understand this too, is how the Bible makes use of poetic and illustrative language. How the Bible makes use of um, not not only parables, but also living parables. Um, and so a lot of the things that we read about, especially in Ezekiel, that, that book is very, very poetic and very, very illustrative. Um, and a lot of the things that happen, I, I believe they happen historically, but they happen historically as kind of a foreshadowing or as a parable of sense um, that has a deeper meaning, right? It, it can have the meaning on the on the historical surface, but it also has a deeper spiritual meaning. So when we're reading through these books, we need to understand how the author is using language and and parables and and how they're using poetry to illustrate and to get across a deeper theological truth. Well, interestingly, if we have a look here, if I bring up, let me bring up this page. Let me just cancel this, bring up a different page. For instance, here, Ahmad Didat talks here about point F, a seven-headed leopard in Revelation 13, 1 to 2. And he somehow brings this up as if this is literal. Now remember, this is this is a vision. It's a dream or whatever it is, right? So he then references this as a seven-headed leopard. So he gives no credence to the actual scholarship and simply just looks at it and scoffs at it, laughs at it without giving it its context. Mm-hmm. And I think this is very typical of Ahmadidat, right? So now in another verse, uh, in another verse, he speaks of Malachi 2. He simply says, dung on your faces, right? Now, this is not literally about dung on your faces. It's an insult. It's like saying you're going to be, you're going to feel shame. You're going to be embarrassed, mm -hmm. right? There'll be egg on your face. This is quite literally the, the equivalent of the modern term, you're going to end up with egg on your face. We don't mean you're going to literally have egg on your face, right? So they're saying here that you are departed out of the way, that is to the priests. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, said the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before the people. You have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Judah hath dealt treacherously and an abomination. This is showing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, and he married the daughter of a strange God. Now, in terms of this, right, you shall know that this, now my covenant with him of was of life and peace. Right. So here, basically the statement is that they broke the Ten Commandments. They would be, in sh they would be shamed for the iniquity. Right. For breaking the Ten Commandments. Of course, we know that Muhammad broke every one of the Ten Commandments. So, yeah. So this is simply about shame. It's just saying, like, you're going to have egg on your faces for this. And that's it.
but he provides no context and this is simply how he does things your thoughts yeah i mean i was just looking up um the word hyperbole um and and what that means and i was going to share my screen but it, it's not that it's not that complex so i can just kind of read it out to you guys so hi hyperbole is basically just an extravagant and exaggeration um, yeah. So the example they use in Merriam Whipster is such as a mile high ice cream cone. Um, the Bible is chocked full of hyperbolic language, language. that comes yes. back to the illustrative poetic words um, that are that are meant to be understood in a deeper sense and not just taken exactly literally. Correct. So, yeah, so this is what they do now. Of course, the Quran does claim to be literal, but when we read it as such, apparently we misunderstand it. Right, so hopefully this does, you know, there, there's lots of, there are many other things. We'll do another show, of course, and probably more than one to go mm -hmm. through more of this. But I want to end off, I want to move to another section. So, so Ahmadita takes exception with the fact that the Bible mentions a history, a story of threats, things that were said to the Jews, right? About poop and peep, right? About being forced to eat cake burned, right? Using, using fuel using dung as fuel right and of course now let's have a look and of course they're having dung on your faces remember this would make them unclean basically the story is that they are unclean these priests are unclean right that's all it means right they're unclean they're, they're not holy anymore right because they've sinned but now let's talk about my chapter called you're in luck okay drinking <laughs> muhammad's wee wee right i i Right, I spent a lot of time thinking up that 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 um, I'm hoping to win an Oscar for this. I spent a lot of time thinking this up. It's very right. good writing. Excellent, thank you very much. So you're in luck, you guys. You you're all in luck. Sorry, especially Muhammad. You're in luck too. Anyway, mm -hmm. drinking Muhammad's wee wee. Let's have a look at this discussion. Now we have these biblical stories, but let's have a look at this thing called Islamic virtues from a website called Islamic Virtues. This day I've perfected your religion for you. And it says here in this blog, with the tags, cure of diseases, heavenly drink, and urine of the prophet. Okay. Benefits of drinking the blessed urine of our holy prophet. Mm. And it's posted by Islamic Virtues in Islamic Medicine, which is about as medicinal as Islamic <laughs> maths is mathematical. And Islamic science <laughs> is scientifical. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I'm, I'm thirsty, but I'm not going to drink. I, I don't know why. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no other person in history has had so many blessings bestowed upon him, such as were bestowed by Allah on our prophet. If the Kafir, that's you and me, were aware of even a tiny fraction of them, they would abandon their stubbornness and embrace Islam wholeheartedly. Take, for example, the case where a companion of the prophet drinks his blessed urine only to discover that she now has been shielded completely from the fire of hell. Imam wow. Siyuti, very, very, <laughs> Imam Siyuti is a highly respected Islamic scholar, narrates an authentic report, an authentic report, in his al Hasa is Al-Kubra, page 253, published by blah, blah, blah. And he says, <clears throat> sorry, and he says, the prophet's urine. Okay, so now, guys, you're in for a treat. And you need to understand you're in for a great treat, a warm treat, okay, a, a lukewarm treat, yellow. And wine is bad for you, just so by the way, guys, get, get off the wine, right? Mm -hmm. So this one is called the scholar's pen. Recognize ignorance and struggle to bring back your traditionality, which is why you're in for a treat. So seek tools of knowledge and dispel <laughs> the darkness of whatever. The prophet's urine, the answer to an objection made by this guy. Now... This is in Birmingham, United Kingdom. Okay, let's let's have a look. This guy is a graduate of an actual Islamic university. Okay, so he's mm -hmm. actually a trained scholar, trained theologian. So this is this was said in 2005 at Wembley Arena, London. This article is written in defense of Sayyid Muhammad al Yaqubi's subsequent statement, which he expressed during his talk on the National Maulid Gathering in London. I wish I was Muhammad's urine, which passed out of him, pure and a cure. And they capitalize Muhammad's name. So he wishes he was Muhammad's wee wee, his little yellow, warm wee wee. Peace be mm. upon you. Well, warm peace be upon you. <laughs> so he wishes he was Muhammad's urine. Okay, but this is okay. This is 
allegorical language, hyperbolic language, poetic, that's not okay. But literally drinking Muhammad's wee-wee, that's a-okay. Right, so this guy said in, in a crowd, and if you read the note on this, it's a crowd of 30,000 people he said this to. Okay? Peace be upon him, or uh, warm peace be upon him. So let, let's have a look at what they actually say here. So, so these are all the references to mentions of the prophet's urine. They speak of paradise and Muhammad's urine. And Muhammad's urine, as some of the scholars say, is from the water of paradise. Muhammad's wee-wee, his yellow wee-wee, is from the water of paradise. Okay? His concession to those who drank Muhammad's urine and his blood. So people drank Muhammad's urine and drank his blood. Okay? Imam Khurtbi narrates the very same incident as recorded in Bar al-Istab. And they speak of people, someone who drank Muhammad's urine and also his blood. Then we speak of, here are some of the narrations which explicitly mention the purity of Muhammad's urine. May Allah shower peace and warm yellow blessings upon him as a cure. Okay? No wonder Muhammad Ijab was so into his golden showers because to him it's I was a thinking good thing. the same thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Suyuti also has an entire chapter on this issue in his al khasa is Al-Kubra in which he narrated this incident entitled blah 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 chapter on seeking cure from his urine may Allah send peace and blessings warm peace and blessings upon him and I believe Allah did now who said the messenger of Allah is to pray to Allah at his house and made it long once Muhammad urinated in the well which was situated inside the house now look as you guys know it's common practice to urinate in the shower we all do it. Just just admit it. We all do. We all... I mean, no, no, sorry. Not the shower, the sink. We all go to the kitchen. There we and we go. take... We all do it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. No, no, we don't. Good God, that's... That's filthy. That is filthy. But hey, Mo is a guest in your house. He wants to take a little... Uh, he wants to go in the sink. What do you say? Mohammed? little boys room in the kitchen. <laughs> Disgusting. So Muhammad urinates in the well in this person's house. And Anna said there was no well in Medina which tasted more cool and sweet than the water in this well. When the Sahaba came, I served them with the sweet water of that well. <laughs> Good stuff. Would you like some tea? <laughs> oh I washed it goodness. in the sink. I washed it in the sink. I. Uh, it's going to taste sweet. During the night, I rose, and in a state of thirst, I drank whatever was in the bowl. In the morning, I told him what I'd done, to which Muhammad smiled and says, You will never have pain in your stomach. Because, of course, Muhammad used to urinate in a bowl and put it under the bed. Now, I know we don't do that because we are not like them. We, we go to the toilet, and we do it there, and we flush. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't flush. That, that was for, that's for other people. And she drank the stuff in the bowl. Personally, I haven't knows that works. I don't know about you. What about, what about you, AT? What are your thoughts on that? I am, first of all, I'm absolutely disgusted by by all of this. Um, and, and the fact that it is still in, like, there, <laughs> there are people in the 21st century writing about this who've gone to school. They've got master's degrees, doctorate degrees. They, like, they understand math and science and logic and and and, and they go and they write this. And they believe it. It's just crazy to me how someone can have a mind, an intelligent mind, and yet they their their religion just kind of distorts, um, you know, what would otherwise be a logical conclusion to them creating the most insane and illogical conclusions. Um, there's there's two things I want to point out uh, about this. First thing is. Um, I can almost assure you that if I show this to a Muslim, they're going to say, oh, that's weak. That's not true. That's blah, blah, blah. Right. They're going to say that this is slander, according to them. Right. But really, at the yeah. end of the day, it's it's truthful. And as a, if, if you're a textual critic or a historian and you're parsing through all of this stuff, you're going to be utilizing the criteria of embarrassments. And it's yep. embarrassing. This is embarrassing stuff. So although the Muslims are going to deny that this is true, <clears throat> if you're an actual historian or a textual critic, you're going to go, no, this is absolutely true that people believe this. Um, because if it wasn't true, who in their right mind would leave this in their sources yeah. if it weren't no. true? Correct. Now, understand this. I covered this on Friday. So let me, let me actually add to this. 
Okay. Now, you've seen when I spoke of how they say that, for instance, Christians are impure. We are filthy. We are not mm. just, right? So what they mean is that we, in fact, I mean, as you, as you saw, they say that we would feel no problem if we were to, uh, hold on, it says here, that they say that, for instance, we claim that, that Jesus was in the womb of Mary, in, of Mary between blood and piss. Quite bluntly, they state that. And, um, and feces. And, of course, they say that we um, would happily sit in church. And I, I, I mentioned this the other day. I can't remember exactly where that was. But that we would sit in church. We would urinate in our pants. Urine dripping down our legs, urine on the benches, and we would pray in church like this, as if it's fine. And they state within the Sharia, I mean, and this and this is standard Orthodox Islamic belief that Christians are this filthy, right? This is written in Ibn Qayyim's book. He's one of their major scholars, right? Quite bluntly, openly. <sighs> and filth in Islam is urine, excrement, and blood. These are filthy, and it makes you impure. Okay, and of course, Muhammad does say that you are. Anything wet, anything moist, right, like that would make you filthy. And of course, if you do not free yourself of traces of urine, you will go to hell. You'll be tormented in the grave. Muhammad says himself here, these two are being tormented not for anything excessive. One of them did not free himself of traces of urine. Take care to remove, to remove all vestiges of urine because if you have urine on your person, your prayer is not acceptable. Allah doesn't hear your prayers, which is fascinating because now, Urine causes you to go straight to hell in Islam, literally. Mm. Urine yeah. is the foremost cause of Muslims going to hell, believe it or not. I didn't write it. But, here, have a cup. Uh, I think you have gone quiet on us, buddy. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. Now I can hear you. You're, you're, you're back again. I don't know why Sorry. you got you got muted for a second. Sorry, keep keep going. <laughs> So, so yeah, your thoughts on that, though. So, in other words, so here we've got many, from the Sharia, urine is filthy. Christians are filthy, right? Because we don't do ablution the way they do. And they state that we would literally take a leak in the church, water, urine running down our legs in church, on the pew, and still pray and not think nothing of it. This is what literally is written by their scholars and taught mm -hmm. to them. And yet, urine, which would send them straight to hell, is somehow clean when you drink Mo's. Uh, somehow he's exempt from from this prohibition. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, this is hypocrisy, but your thoughts. And what, um, what do actually, you think? Speaking of hypocrisy, I've been writing notes for myself here uh, as, as you were talking. So that's that's one thing that I was thinking about, right? So we've got Ahmed Didat here saying how how disgusting it is for the Bible to include, you know, drinking urine or eating poop and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and yet his own sources are glorifying doing that kind of stuff um, when it comes to when it comes to Muhammad. So hypocrisy, by definition, is the practice of engaging in the same behavior or activity for which one criticizes another or practice of claiming to have moral standards or belief to which one's own behavior does not conform. Right. So obviously, uh, Islam in general is hypocritical. Ahmed Didat here is being hypocritical. So when talking about urine and, and excrement and all that kind of stuff. Um, also, they have this, they're so disgusted by communion of Christ, right? Where we we drink the yeah. wine and, and we take the bread, which is the, the representation of Christ's blood. And um, they're disgusted by that. And yet in their own sources, if you were to drink Muhammad's blood, um, you're free of sin and you never go to hell or whatever it is. Um, and, and then the other note I had on here also was, um, you were saying traces of urine are going to send you to hell. Uh, I, I seem to be recalling a story. Maybe you can help me out, Lloyd. I, I sometimes, I, I forget details here, but was there a certain prophet who would go pray with traces of his own excrement on his, um, semen? garments? Yes. Is that what There's it was? Huh? Semen. Yes, that is certainly true. In fact, hold on, I can actually bring that up uh, if you want me to do so. Hang on. Uh, I don't know if I can handle any more of this disgustingness. No, uh, I mean, um, let's have a look here, guys. So uh, let's have a look at all the references. Uh, so Muhammad, 
so here's a, here's about 22 references if I recall. I used to wash traces of semen from the clothes of the prophet and he used to go for prayers while traces of water were still on it. Um, she replied, I used to wash semen off the clothes of Allah's messenger. His clothes were soiled with semen. Aisha, I used to wash it off the clothes of the messenger. Um, I scraped off the semen, right? Uh, semen, semen. She says, I often scrape semen from the garment of the messenger with my hand. Um, there used to be semen on the garment of the messenger and he would go to pray wearing the garment. I used to wash semen. If I found semen on the garment of the messenger dried up, I scraped it off with my nails. A six-year-old girl with semen stains under her nails. Um, yeah, guys, this is Islam. Uh, let me let me finish with this. Uh, yeah, but it's okay when Muhammad does it. Uh, personally, I know nobody who uh, urinates in the sink. I know nobody who uh, would want to do something like that. And also, I don't know anybody who has semen routinely on their clothes and goes to church. Unless that's the Islamic equivalent of Sunday best. Things were different back <laughs> in the 7th century, right? They always tell us. Uh, so, uh, can you just, just, guys, yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, this is Tafsir al-Khutbi, volume 1. Good to be right, Tafsir, and he is pretty blunt. He and Ibn Kathir. I think this guy's even more blunt than Ibn Kathir. But if someone is physically forced to drink wine, he may drink it. But if it is on account of hunger or thirst, he should rather die, basically. He should not do so. That is what Malik said, the founder of the Maliki school of fiqh. It is the position of Shafi, okay? And Allah completely forbade wine and forbade carrion. Of course, when you go to paradise, there will be rivers of wine running through paradise. I, you tell me why. I, I don't know. I didn't write it. <clears throat> I, if wine will remove hunger and thirst, he should drink it because Allah says that pigs are impure, but then permits them in case of necessity. I've said this before. There is not a single, single rule in Islam that cannot be broken. Every single one. Nothing in Islam is so sacred that it cannot be broken, lied about, twisted, undone. Understand? Mm. Allah calls wine an impurity, but, but urine, drink that stuff. Someone in dire need may drink blood, but not wine. Blood is impure. Okay? It's najasat, right? So is urine. But, but have a drink with milk. Here, drink some camel urine. That's all good. He may eat carrion, but not take advantage of lost camels. He may drink urine, but should not go near wine. And, and again, someone wrote that? Like wrote a, that. a scholar, a scholar. Sat down, went to school... Learned how to write, wrote a book, someone read it, go, oh, this is great, let's publish it, and people read it and believed it. Is is, is that basically how this works? This is with reference to Quran 2, 173. Understand? This, and this is a major scholar of Islam, one of the top most respected scholars in Islamic history. Yeah. And this is good stuff, apparently. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um... <laughs> I've got a couple of things to add, if, if, if that's okay. Please go ahead. We should call it a day of run over time already. Yeah. But yeah, I'll please just, go I'll ahead. I'll just highlight really quickly just some hypocrisy things here. And I just want to highlight some differences between Christianity and Islam. So uh, <clears throat> Muslims do ablution every single day, multiple times a day, right? And they're doing that as a form of cleanliness and like washing away impurities and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they're required to do so daily because I guess every single day they get filthy and filthy and filthy. Whereas in Christianity, we do baptism one time and because God is so great in Christianity that one baptism wipes away all of our sins and all of our impurities. So what's what's better, uh, Islam or Christianity? Um, fear of hell, right? Muslims have to pray five times a day. They can go to sleep at night, and if they if they haven't prayed appropriately, they you know wake up dead and they're in hell. Whereas Christianity, yes, we all have fear of hell as well, but we only have to accept Christ once, be born again, baptized in the Spirit, and guess what? We don't have to do it five times a day. We have faith because God is greater. God is the greatest. Um, what's interesting to me about uh, the Islamic concept of heaven is that there's sin in heaven. That's weird to me. So if drinking wine is a sin, according to them, they're going to have rivers of wine in heaven. How can there be sin in the presence of heaven? Makes no sense whatsoever. Having 72 virgins on earth, is that cool? No. Is that a sin? Yes. Now, in Islam, I go to, I go to my heaven and I 
get to drink wine, which is the sin, and I get to fornicate with 72 <laughs> wives and and sin essentially. How no, is that's, sin that's additional to your wives? God, that's additional to your it. wives. Say what? Yeah, that's additional to your wives. I don't even know. It's yeah, it's hypocrisy at its yeah. at its greatest, and how how anybody can learn about this and be like, yeah, I'm just going to, I love Muslim. No, no, no. Do like, I just, no. I, it, it, it blows my mind. Yeah, I know. It's look, it's just crazy stuff. I mean, but seriously, have a cup. It's warm. It's yellow. Enjoy. It's good for you. Um, yeah, but it'll send you to hell. But get, understand this is, look, I mean, this is mind blowing, you know, um, compare that. So guys, I'll finish off with this drinking camel urine for medicinal purposes. And this is answered according to Hanafi Fiqh by a very famous mufti. Well, well, a mufti. In other words, he's someone who studied for five to seven years at a seminary. Okay. And this is from Islam QA. You can see here are the links. Mufti online and Islam QA. Islam QA gets 400 million visits a month. Okay. I'm assuming they know what they're doing. Bukhari Sharif is considered as the most authentic hadith compilation. So this guy's question is about a hadith inside Bukhari. Volume 8, Book 82, Hadith 794. It is mentioned about camel urine. Is this Hadith authentic? Should we use camel urine for medicine? And the guy says, yeah, it is permissible for one to consume the urine of camels as medication. I don't recall that that it says so explicitly anywhere in the Quran, but hey, they love putting little things in quotes, you know, parentheses. So yeah, according to the Muftis, most certainly, um, enjoy it. It's warm. So, yeah, on that note, I need to probably go and, I don't know, soap my mouth out or something. <laughs> Please. I don't even know what to do after this. I Like, like if, if you're to fast forward to me in 10 minutes from now, it's going to be me, like, in the shower <laughs> crying. Like, one of those things, like, <laughs> like, trying to wash off the disgustingness. Uh. Yeah, I know, guys. So, um uh, oh, by the way, a last one, a last one. I need to say this. The Messenger of Allah, this is in Sunan Ibn Majah, which is Sahih. This, the Messenger of Allah came out to us holding a small shield in his right hand. He put it down and he sat down and urinated towards it. Some of the people said, look at him, he urinates like a woman. <laughs> I, I remember, in, I think it's in the, the book that doesn't exist in the New Testament. Where they speak mm -hmm. of Jesus having sex with a nine-year-old girl and urinating like a woman. Oh. Actually, no, it doesn't exist. Right. Why? Why is this considered holy scripture? <laughs> urinates like a woman. Now, and does then, the the small shield? Is that like a? Is that? I have are, no are they idea. Say something about. <laughs> I have no idea. But notice, it says, "Woe to you!" Do you know what happened to one of the children of Israel? If any urine touched any part of their clothes, they would cut that part out with scissors. Mm. Okay, so he told them not to do that, so he was tormented in his grave. And there's another there's another where they say that a man got urine on his calf and he would slice off that piece of flesh. Whatever, man, whatever. You guys work it out. I I just read it. I don't write it. So guys, that's it from me for today at least. There's lots more to go through. I think there's plenty more of this where this came from. I hope that was interesting. <laughs> Um, so yeah, now, now you know all about Muhammad's little toilet habits and how Muslims actually will state publicly on to 30,000 people in a live talk that they mm -hmm. want to be Muhammad's wee wee. Um, you know, I, I was like, I remember Sunday school, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. Was that the song? You know, some kids want to be a train driver. Hey man, you know, <laughs> so anyway, guys, that's it from me. <clears throat> Yeah, that's nuts. I think you may have gotten a super chat. I'm trying to go go through. Oh, here. yes. Thank some... you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, there were two anonymous donations, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you were speaking at the time, and uh, I, I did notice it, but thank you very, very much. I'm very grateful for that. It really does help. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless at this point, man. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, guys. So, yeah. Um, so, the, so that's it from us, I think. Um, I guess we'll go back. So yeah, guys, I hope that was helpful and useful. Um, if you want any of these references, drop me a chat. Then the, we'll drop a line in the comment. I'm happy to hook you up with all the books. I have some linked in the description. Like some of those that I referenced, I can also provide you. 
can mm -hmm. find those references yourself. And um, yeah, there's many, many stories about Muhammad and how special it was, like how the trees would, he would grab a tree and walk with the tree. He would take the tree by a branch and the tree would walk with him. The trees so, rather would walk with him to cover him when he went to go, He's, you know, to go when he went to go. The trees would, would form a shield around him to, to shield him out of sight. And then they would disperse back to where they came from. That's, in fact, the most common miracle. Muhammad apparently had more miracles than any other prophet of God. And the, literally the most common miracle he had every day was his poop miracle, where the earth would open up, swallow his poop, a fresh scented fragrance would come out, and then the hole would fill itself in. So, That's, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, KL, KL wants you to bring on Mr. Muslim. Uh, I'm sure I could talk to him and we could, we could maybe have him, uh, you, you could interview him if you wanted to. <laughs> I sure I could. That might be very, um, <clears throat> enlightening. Yeah. So guys, yeah. we should call it a night here. Um, uh, thanks guys. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. So, um, okay. Yeah, I guess. So, so anyway, thank you. I hope that was enlightening. Please leave your comments down below and guys, if you have not yet, please subscribe to Austria Apologetics. There's a link in the description. Please join his channel as well. Sign up there. Uh, guys, I hope this was useful. We went a little bit over time, but yeah, I, I hope that was enlightening and understand. Yep. Yeah, guys. Um, yeah, man, I, I, I'm just shocked when I read these things. I'm like, good grief. They actually write this stuff. It's crazy. It really is. But uh, thank you, Lloyd, for everything, brother. Appreciate you having me on. And um, thank you, everybody, for, for watching. Um, remember, Jesus loves you. Good night, guys. Take care. And uh, stay away from Islam. Mm-hmm. <laughs>